Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series has been a wonderful one on making friends for God, the joy of sharing in His mission. And this is the last lesson in that series entitled, A Step in Faith. It's lesson number 13 for September 26 of 2020. And as usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, in these challenging times, we wonder how we can best witness to those around us. It's easy to think that that's somebody else's responsibility. It's easy to be timid. It's easy to be fearful. Um, but the time has come for all of us to witness to the truths that we know about. Give us the courage to speak up when it's time to speak up and to the right people in the right time. May we follow your guidance, the guidance of your Holy Spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's really impossible to imagine the depth of love that caused Jesus to leave his glorious position in heaven and come to this earth. Why did he do it? What kind of impact has he had on the human race? Jim? First answer what I'd say is 1 John 4, 8, 1 John 4, 16, God is love. Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until redeemed shall stand with the Redeemer before the throne of God. Then, as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all this for us, that he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for but for us took the risk of a failure and eternal loss. Then we shall cast our crowns at his feet and raise the song, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation 12, Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 131. If you were to become more like Jesus, might that involve some sacrifice on your part, considering what he did? when he came to this earth? What kind of sacrifices could we make that would actually impact our world? There are probably not even words in our language to describe the kind of love expressed by God when sending his son to this earth. And one of the best passages to describe that is found in Philippians 2, beginning with verse 5. Charles? The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had he always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own will, free will, he gave up all that he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above all and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so, in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, earth, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is from American Bible Society, 1992, uh, Holy Bible, Good News Translation. Okay, now I have the first big question for you. Does that mean that someday the devil and all his angels will bow down and make that proclamation? Yes. 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 Uh, and we went through this in Revelation chapter 22. Mm -hmm. That's amazing to think that the day is coming. At the th We now know, and in, in putting everything together, this will be at the time of the third coming, that finally when the panorama is shown across the sky and everyone stops in his tracks, the righteous and the wicked, and watch the whole story. I don't know, how long do you suppose that movie will be? <laughs> Forever. <laughs> <laughs> it will take a while. 
and we will see the individual details of Christ's life and the whole thing. And when that's all done, the force of the evidence, the force of the, of the facts will just cause Satan and his angels and everyone else, all the wicked and the righteous, everyone will be down on their knees and saying, God, there is nothing more you could have done. That's just amazing. Well, while we use the term son for Jesus and the term father for God the Father, the Godhead, including the Holy Spirit, have been equal in every way for all eternity. Christ is in no way inferior to his Father, so would it have been any different if God the Father had come to this earth instead of the Son? Had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling his glory and humbling himself, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding its record of its own con condescending grace. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight, in the hearing, in effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. Wow. That it's found in several places, but that's Ellen White, Manuscript Release Number 1581. Yeah, wow. So, even though Christ set aside his divinity and never exercised it on his own behalf while on this earth, he nevertheless was, while he was here on this earth, fully God. I believe, and I think this is clearly taught scripture and in the writings of Ellen White, that any moment, if he had wanted to, he could have flipped that switch and exercised his divinity. He did not. So, what do we know about that? What evidence do we have of his divinity? Well, here's a statement from Ellen White. In Christ is life original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the life, he that hath the Son hath life, 1 John 5, 12. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life, Desire of Ages 530.3. However, Jesus chose to empty himself of all those attributes which he, which he had in heaven. He exemplified to the entire universe the law of love that controls heaven and was willing to come down to our world and make that ultimate sacrifice. By his life and his death, Jesus gave us a choice. One, we can seek to follow his example and with the Holy Spirit's help live lives as close to his life as possible. Or two, we will die his death from separation from God. How, what did he die from? Separation, separation from, from God, God. Is the, who is the only source of life. So Jesus, as a human being, even though he also was divine, his humanity was able to die, when, and it died when he was separated from the source of life, which was his Father. Okay, so now, what would it be like? What would it mean? to have a human being living in the 21st century exemplifying the self-sacrificing love that Jesus exhibited? Do you think people would be attracted by it in our day? Only a minority at best. Could we learn to serve as he served and minister as he ministered? What would that cost us? It cost Jesus everything. Won't heaven be worth any sacrifice we could possibly make on this earth? God has promised that the joys of service and of seeing souls converted to the truth will outweigh the sacrifices even today. So serving God is the, is the best way to have happiness, even here and now on this earth. So when was the last time you truly had to die to self for Christ's sake? Do we have to sacrifice daily to be truly Christian? Well, try to imagine yourself with Peter, Andrew, James, and John fishing all night on the Sea of Galilee. As you come to shore in the morning, ready to stretch out your nets for repair if necessary and drying, because they had these big old cloth, well not cloth, but you know, probably made out of cotton or maybe even wool. Uh, I mean, they didn't have, there was no nylon, there was no, nothing like that. Their nets, they had to dry them, stretch them out and dry them every, night, every morning. Um, if necessary in drying, you see Jesus coming, walking along the shore. 
your life is about to change forever. Matthew 8, Matthew 4, 18 to 22, Jim? Yes. Jesus walked along the shore of the sea of Lake Galilee. He saw two brothers who were fishermen, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew, catching fish in the lake with a net. Jesus said to them, Come with me, and I will teach you to catch people. At once they left their nets and went with him. He went on and saw two other brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. They were in their boat with their father Zebedee, getting their nets ready. Jesus called them, and at once they left the boat and their father and went with, went with him. That is a good news Bible. Okay. Now, here's the next big question for our discussion. Why do you suppose these men, some of whom were married, we don't know, we know for sure that Peter was. We don't know for sure about the others. We're willing to drop everything and make the uncertain choice to follow Jesus. That's interesting. You know, if, if, if try to imagine back there, had they had any experience, did they have any association or any observation or heard, yes. heard anything about him? Oh, yes. Part of that time. Yeah, remember that if you lay out the life of Jesus in his ministry, we'll just stop his ministry, he was baptized. And then, of course, he, had, he went out into the wilderness and he went up to Cana to, to do that thing and so forth. There was a six-month period uh, which he was doing various things we know very little about. Then he started his Judean ministry. For the next year, he was working what we'd say under the radar without really any followers. They would come sometimes and follow him and then they would go back home and they would come and follow him. And go back. But he, these four and others as well, Philip and Nathaniel as well, came and sometimes they would follow him, sometimes they wouldn't. So they knew about him. They knew about him. And so then at the, at the end of that year of working in Judea, uh, John the Baptist was arrested and Jesus said, it's time, they, were all, they had already said, you know, if, if we can catch this guy, we're going to catch him and kill him. And so Jesus moved his activities to Galilee and it was after he'd been a short time in Galilee that he called them to minister with him in Galilee. So they had known him for a year and a half at least already. So. But, but the, go ahead. But even then, uh, their commitment to yeah. to the Lord perhaps arguably was not fully there. He had mm -hmm. to at least document it that he called them twice at mm -hmm. the beginning mm -hmm. and even at the end. This is after his crucifixion. Yeah. Then they realize that there's something special we really truly need to abandon. Well, remember though, when he when he called them, their idea was this man is going to be the Messiah. We're going to be part of royalty. There you are. So did it fit in with the, the, their understanding that from the, what we call the Old Testament? It, 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 yeah, it, he, he, he was. They were minds was somewhat prepared and they were ready to. The few there are some predictions in the Old Testament about the second coming and even the third coming of Jesus, but you can't tell from looking at those that they refer to the second coming. We we now know because of our background and what's happened already, but they had interpreted those those things as happening at the first coming, and they believed that Christ would come and you know rise to power and. To overthrow the Romans. Get they rid thought of that the was Romans. yeah. That was that was their theme. So it, it, in a way, it was a little bit selfish. Yes, they, it was. They were not yeah. pure. Uh, yes, until <laughs> several. They had their own over agenda. Three years later. No. Yeah. <laughs> now let's agenda. say there are some hints in the Gospels to suggest that James and John may have been cousins of Jesus. I don't have time to go through that now, but that's a possibility. So they may have known him even from earlier in, in life. But all four of those men had followed Jesus at least at times since his baptism. So we see now he's we've already known him and sort of followed him for a year and a half already. What was it that led them to drop everything and follow Jesus? And the bigger question, what qualified those men for service? Would Jesus make such a call to anyone in our day? Charles? We are in... Uh Jesus chose? Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because they had not been schooled in the traditions 
and erroneous customs of their time. They were men of native ability, and they were humble and teachable men whom, could, whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, there is many a man and woman patiently treading the round of the daily toil, unconscious that he possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculty, faculties. It was such men that Jesus called to be his collaborators. Uh, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. When the disciples came forth from the Savior's training, they were no longer ignorant of, or uncultured. They had been, become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Ellen White, Desire of Ages, page 250. Wow. And yes, yet it really wasn't, wow. it was still after the crucifixion before it dawned on them yes. that what you were talking about, Jim, the, the selfishness, the I'm going, you know, I'm going to be part of this new regime. Yeah. Even at that point. Or, or just before he, he, to go back to Jerusalem, he says, you know, if I go back, they're going to kill me. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, he must have did. It went uh, over their head. Just, just right past him and just. Uh, a bullet, right? One in one ear and out the other. <laughs> well, uh, didn't, didn't Peter chastise him and the Lord says, yeah. get behind me? <laughs> that was earlier, but yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But it was, it's a mixed, it's a mixed phenomenon because on one hand, they did understand Christ's mission in healing and in making life better. Mm -hmm. They got that part of it. Well, it, it was foreign to them, though. They had, who else was doing that? Nobody. It was, yeah. it was unique. It was a unique. So they knew there was something that he had special. People were coming from Damascus and, and down in, all the way down in the Sinai Peninsula were coming to see here and, and because he was the biggest thing that was going on. There was no question about that. And they didn't have cell phones and the internet and all that sort of stuff. No, and, uh, no, no. The, no word, competition. the word was passing, was going from mouth to mouth. And no, but no masks. <laughs> no masks, yeah. A short time later, Jesus called Matthew, a tax collector, to follow him. Matthew 9, 9. Jesus left that place, and as he walked along, he saw a tax collector named Matthew sitting in his office. He said to him, follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. Do you suppose he left his money sitting there? What happened when his superiors came around to collect? Have you ever wondered that? I might have tidied, tidied things up there. <laughs> A little bit? <laughs> we don't know where the text is. <laughs> <laughs> well, tax collectors were Jews who, for the sake of money, had agreed to work for Herod and the Roman Empire to collect taxes from their fellow Jews. You can imagine how popular they were. They were among the most hated and most despised people on the land. This should lead us to ask two questions. One, why would Jesus choose to call such a person to follow him? And two, why would Matthew leave his lucrative business to follow Jesus? And what does God ask us to give up in order to follow him? So why, why would he call Matthew? What do you think? Must have been good with numbers. He probably was good with numbers, yeah. Um, is that a good enough reason for calling someone? Well, it's probably logical, and uh, was it was a good spirit, uh, willing to respond to, to education and teaching. So he, he also um, he he also had the knowledge of the workings of the government, yeah, and of how. Thing, how Jesus could get into places that maybe he wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. There was a certain amount of, of savviness about him. Yeah. yeah. And what happened shortly thereafter? What did Matthew do? Do you remember? 
the next thing we read about, he called a feast. Oh, that's he gave a really? feast for Jesus, yeah. and he invited all sorts of unsavory people <laughs> to come <laughs> to his feast. And that made the Pharisees even more angry. Well, think of the story of Saul, later called Paul. He was raised as a devout Jew and a Pharisee. He was young, energetic, and committed. Then he had that experience on the road to Damascus. He was on his way to arrest and kill Christians. I mean, there's, no que there's no question about the fact that that's what he was planning to do. What changed? Paul did not change his Sabbath. He did not change his diet. He did not change, it, change his belief in the scriptures. What did he change? His attitude toward God. He changed his picture of God. That's what changed. And it wasn't a radical change in the, how long was he in, in uh, Saudi Arabia there? What, several three, years? Three years. Okay, before he really went out and started, uh, and, and so. Well, he, 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 almost immediately he started preaching in the synagogues in Damascus, and they said, is this the guy who came here to kill all of us? You know, and. To the point that he had to be yeah, and so out. He, he, and, and he, he ran away. He, he right. fled to the Saudi Arabia, and he came back and he started preaching again after three years, and that was the time they were really ready to arrest him and kill him, and they had to let him down in a basket on a, a from, a, from a wall, from the outside the wall, so he could escape and go back to Jerusalem. Well, look at Acts 9, 3 to 6 and 10 to 20. As Saul was coming near the city of Damascus, suddenly a light from the sky flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And this is a key passage. Let me take a little side trip here. This is a key passage in understanding how God feels about his people. Why did you persecute? Why do you persecute me? Now, Paul isn't, well, who are you, Lord? You know, he's still angry. But God regards every one of us as his child. And if something happens to us, if we're really following God's plan for our lives, as far as God is concerned, it is happening to He Himself. And that's why when He says, I am a jealous God, mm -hmm. remember there's a mm -hmm. famous person, she says, I don't think I can trust that, that when He says He's a jealous God. No, that's just because you don't understand King James English. Yeah. God is jealous for all of His, his kids. They're the precious. good ones, the bad ones, and the ugly ones. Mm -hmm. He wants, And what pains Him the most is when pious frauds, like these uh, uh, religious pious leaders, were misrepresenting him. Yeah. Going on, who are you, Lord, he asked. I am Jesus whom you persecute. I mean, you know, Paul, at that point, if he had a few seconds to think about that, he must have thought, okay, you're going to kill me. I've been trying to kill your people, and you're saying that I'm persecuting you. Okay, payback, right? The voice said, but get up and go into the city where you will be told what you must do. God didn't even sort of bowl him over with that all That must have been an unsettling moment. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, it, it, not what? knowing, I mean, just out of the blue. You go, see? wait, you know, expect, um, wait for further information. I'm going to just go on faith. And the light's gone. Just go on faith. And you can't see. Yeah. You're blind. That, yeah. that I've, I've had years ago. I had arc burn, mm -hmm. and then I about to two, about two o'clock in the morning I woke up f mm -hmm. from that, and the sensation was like somebody had shoveled sand into my eyeballs, and I was up there on grinding their <laughs> heels in my eyeballs, and I'm wondering about my should have had my sins forgiven because I thought I was dying. <laughs> <laughs> it was it was that painful. <laughs> you know, I walking the year. I've seen this. Yeah, about two o'clock, three o'clock, people would come, <laughs> you know, yeah, they're absolutely miserable, they think they are dying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, oh, it, yeah. It, it's a, that, the eye, and then you, man, because everything is re reading, somehow you're, you, that's how you communicate in life. Right, right. You know, yeah. Well, there was a believer, and continue with our story, there was a believer, this is a Christian now, in Damascus named Ananias. He had a vision in which the Lord said to him, Ananias, here I am, Lord, he answered. The Lord said to him, get ready and go to Straight Street. And Straight Street is still there. 
Mm. If if it's if it were safe to go to Syria, you could go visit it. There's there's a small upstairs church. Anyway, get ready and go to Straight Street and at the house of Judas, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He is praying. And in a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come in and place his hands on him so that he might see again. <laughs> now, now it's time for Ananias to <laughs> die fall over from shock. <laughs> Ananias says, Lord, many people have told me about this man and about all the terrible things he has done to your people in Jerusalem. And he has come to Damascus with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who worship you. So the word had gotten ahead, gotten their head of him. The Lord said to him, Go, because I have chosen him to serve me, to make my name known to Gentiles and kings and to the people of Israel. Now, at that point in time, if Paul had spoken those words to, well, to anybody, um, if God spoke those words, even to Ananias, which would be more of a shock, that the gospel was going to go to Gentiles or to kings? <laughs> Probably more of a shock that God was going to go to Gentiles. What if God had told Paul right there, I've chosen you to go to the Gentiles? <laughs> He's a Pharisee. Right, right. He's a Pharisee. <laughs> okay? And I myself will show him all that he must suffer for my sake. So Ananias went, entered into the house where Saul was, and placed his hands on him. Brother Saul, he said, that must have been a little difficult to say. The Lord has sent me. Jesus himself who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here. He sent me so that you might see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Was that his baptism by the Holy Spirit? Maybe so. Mm -hmm. At once, something like fish scales fell from Saul's eyes and he was able to see again. He stood up and was baptized. And after he had eaten, his strength came back. Saul stayed for a few days with the believers in Damascus. He went straight to the synagogues and began to preach that Jesus was the Son of God. But as we've already mentioned, shortly he, he went off to Arabia where he spent three years with what I would call a fruit basket upset. I am almost 100% sure that he had the entire Hebrew Old Testament memorized. That was what the, the real scholars did in those days. Memorize the entire Old Testament. So he didn't have to get out his Bible to read. It was already there. So he had to think through the whole Old Testament. Okay, wow, oh yeah, so th that's what that meant. That's what that meant. That's what, so he had to, we had the fruit basket upset. He just had to rethink the whole Old Testament in light of what he now knew about Jesus. And you wonder how much of that was going through his head while he was blind. Yeah. Thinking, is there a reason for this? Especially since they believed that, um, what was it you told us? That your sins yeah. is what what caused the, yeah. the your difficulties. Your problems, yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I wonder that same question. Did Paul think, with, now he's sitting there in his blindness, is he thinking, okay, God is just getting ready to come back, come back and zap me? Yeah. But I, I want to think that he was also thinking about a few days, a few weeks back, he is a man... He masterminded the killing of. He has never seen a man being killed like him, like uh, so, uh, Stephen, yeah. right? And Stephen looks up. I see Jesus sitting by this uh, by God's throne. Says, "Yeah, I can make the connections. He mm -hmm. could. Paul was not stupid. This is he could make the connections. Yeah, this makes sense. Yeah, this makes sense." So that must something great was happening in his mind. I want to think. Okay. Think of the other people Jesus chose to work for him. Demoniacs, mm -hmm. former demon-possessed people. The Samaritan woman, who had already five husbands. First, first missionaries, right? <laughs> These are first missionaries. A formerly demon-possessed prostitute. Yeah. One of his best friends. Yeah. And I'm sure she wanted to marry him. I am absolutely sure, I, and I, I'm not going to go into all these Hollywood productions and so forth, but what woman would not be just totally in love with Jesus? I, want I don't to know, maybe Diane, I should let you think about, <laughs> talk about that. But I still want to, I want to think that she saw Christ in his real divine beauty, and oh, yeah. he was, she was madly in love with the person of Jesus Christ yeah. as God himself. That's yeah. how, how I look at her. Yeah. A fascinating, fascinating woman. And a tax collector. 
a group of Galilean fishermen, and thousands of others. How did Jesus impact their lives and what did they do about it? Paul never stopped testifying to his belief in Jesus. No doubt he was testifying to the Roman executioners who led him out to be beheaded. Can you imagine that? Mm. But one of the last things he wrote to his friend Timothy said, Timothy, excuse me, 2 Timothy 4, verses 5 to 8. But you must keep control of yourself in all circumstances, enduring suffering, do the work of a preacher of the good news, and perform your whole duty as a servant of God. As for me, the hour has come for me to be sacrificed, and the time is here for me to leave this life. I have done my best in the race. I have run the full distance, I have kept the faith, and now there is waiting for me the victory prize of being put right with God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. I do not only, and not excuse only, me, and not only to me, but all those who wait with love for him to appear. Good news, Bible. Wow. Paul, remember, was so persuasive in explaining his Christianity that members of Nero's household became mm. Christians. Uh, let's look at that. Philippians 4.22 The brothers and sisters here with me send you their greetings. All God's people here send greetings, especially those who belong to the emperor's palace. Imagine people working for that despot. Mm. We have very limited knowledge of all the trials and troubles that Paul went through for Jesus. However, here is a very brief account. Charles? First Corinthians. Second, second Corinthians. Second Corinthians 11, 25 to 30. Three times I was whipped by the Romans. Those are 39 lashes, I want to think. Mm -hmm. yep. Save, uh, no, 40, 40 save ones, yes. 39. Well, just to be, I mean, not to be a nitpick in here, but did the Romans do, they weren't concerned. It was, a, it was the Jews, you had yeah. the 39. Yeah, right. 40 save one, I think right. that's a term that they That used. was Jewish, yeah, that's so Jewish. So this probably, they just maybe flogged the dickens out of him. <laughs> yeah, maybe even Romans, more. The Romans probably didn't have any limitations. Mm -hmm. And once I was stoned, I had been in three shipwrecks, and once I spent 24 hours in the water. Well, we know the story of a, a shipwreck later in his life. We don't even know anything about, about these shipwrecks. This, right? So this not, was not in the one going to Malta? Not at all. Not at this all. This doesn't uh, happen until a long time later. From Crete to Malta, I thought maybe that was, maybe this is no. not the one. Okay. In my many travels, I have been in danger from floods and from making friends. No. Oh, now from many Robbers. travels I have been <laughs> in danger from floods and from Fellow robbers. Ah, mm -hmm. this is a little mix up somewhere. Yeah. Okay, robbers. In danger from fellow Jews and from Gentiles. There have been dangers in the cities, dangers in the walls, dangers in the high seas, dangers from false false friends. Uh -huh. There has been work and toil. Often I have gone without sleep. I have been hungry and thirsty. I have often been without enough food, shelter or clothing, and not to mention other things. Every day I am under the pressure of my concern for all the churches. When someone is weak, then I feel weak too. When someone is led into sin, I am filled with distress. If I must boast, I will boast about things that show how weak I am. Good news, Bible. Wow. wow. Think about how that, what that says about Paul and how he has become like Christ. From being a Pharisee, from being a member of the Sanhedrin as a young man. Now he, he this is what he we, we may not have time. Go ahead. So I might as well kind of front load or middle load. Um, this experience has to come into the hearts of Christians, some mm -hmm. Adventists, or else we're not going anywhere. Yeah. We're not. Mm. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, I just borrowed this book from Dr. Hart. He just yeah. brought it in. You know, this came out, uh, Worcester Wall. You probably knew him. Yes. You knew him. 
and um, long time, early 70s, uh, a mission possible. Uh, in ratio, people during his time, more people knew about seven Adventists that they know in this world today. At the same time, for the gospel of this kingdom is to be taken to the world and they shall, then shall then come. Yeah. What's happening, I mean, we're not going to be doomsday people, but we are not too far. Yeah. And the, I believe that the Lord will have, is has people like this, for, because conventionally what we're doing as church, uh, when the, we're going to be here throughout eternity to no. go home. So, so let me ask you out there, how has the love of God affected your life? Has it called you into action? Remember that 2 Corinthians 5.14 states clearly, for the love of Christ compels us. Commentators and other Bible translators have suggested this translation, the love of God leaves us no choice. Mm. What would that mean to you? As we know, Peter's behavior in the courtyard of Annas and Caiaphas while Jesus was on trial, was shameful and disgusting. Um, and I hope you're familiar with that thing. Might be, we can read a couple of those verses really quick. Uh, here it is, John 18, verse 17. The girl at the gate said to Peter, Aren't you also one of, it, of the disciples of this man? And then going down to 25. Peter was still standing there keeping himself warm, so the other said to him, Aren't you also one of the disciples of that man? And one of the high priest slavers, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, spoke up, Didn't I see with you with him in the garden? Again, Peter said no, and at once a cock crowed. Wow. But Jesus had got, not given up on Peter. He turned to look straight at Peter just as he made his worst denial, and Peter saw him. While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Savior turned from the frowning judges, looked upon his poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. In that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. He, Peter, remembered his Jesus' solemn charge. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Matthew 26, 41. He witnessed again the scene of the judgment hall. It was torture to his bleeding heart to know that he had added the heaviest burden to the Savior's humiliation and grief. On the very spot where Jesus had poured out his soul in agony to his father, Peter fell upon his face and wished that he might die. That's from Desire of Ages, pages 712 and 713. And where was it that Jesus poured out his whole ag agony? Garden of if we had time to read the whole context here, Peter left the, the, the place. He went out and he began to weep and he was crying and running and he didn't even know where he was going and all of a sudden he realized he was at the gate of the Garden of Eden, a garden, a garden, garden, garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And he went in there and just collapsed right on the very spot that he knew Jesus had formerly knelt and prayed uh, down with his face on the ground right there. And Jesus said, you know, I mean, Paul, Peter said, Lord, what can I do? Mm -hmm. So just as Peter had denied his Lord three times later, Jesus called him for him to re reassert his love three times. And it's interesting how that all took place. Meeting for a final time on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, do you remember exactly what happened there? The, the, the fishermen had been out all night. They, they you know, Jesus would, had, had gone, you know, ascended back to heaven. They weren't sure what to do. So someone said, well, let's, let's fish. Let's go fish. They went out fish fished, and they fished all night. What did they catch? Nothing. Uh, it was, nothing. It was Peter, though, who says, let's go fishing. Yeah. yeah. They caught nothing. And as they were coming in, after working all night, dog tired, I'm sure, they just happened to see somebody quite a distance away walking on the shore. Said, have you caught anything? No. Cast your nets on the other side. Now, I want you to think about this. They were coming in. And they were accustomed 
their boats running along parallel with the coast, and where the fish would be out in the deeper water, right? Water so you would cast your, your nets out on the deeper side. And so this person says, cast your net on the shore side. Think about that. In the shallow water? You cast your net in the shallow water? <laughs> but they did it. They knew better than that, but they followed yeah. the advice. <laughs> well, so Jesus sought to encourage Peter, and of course then they came. their, their nets were so full that they, they couldn't pull them in. So Jesus sought to encourage Peter and give him a sense of forgiveness, acceptance, and purpose. He then began to question Peter. In his first two questions, he asked Peter, do you love, and the word in Greek is agape, me. That's a divine, completely unselfish kind of love. And Peter responded each time by saying, I love, I phileo you. What is phileo? Phileo is, phileo is the kind of love you have for a family member, something like this. That's a, a, a very good, but a human love. Finally, Jesus asked him, do you really phileo me? It seemed as if Jesus was saying this, Peter, I know that your love for me flows through the weak channels of your humanity. You have denied me three times, but I forgive you. My grace is yours. Begin where you are. Go to work from me, and your love for me will grow and expand into deep, divine love for others. Peter failed Jesus at a very crucial moment in Christ's life, yet that did not disqualify Peter from serving. serving. Jesus sent a forgiven, changed Peter out to work for him. Okay, so try once again to imagine how you would, have, would feel if Jesus himself told you that someday you would be crucified. Remember what did he say at the end of that conversation? Someday you will be bound and tied and taken where you don't want to go. And Peter knew what he was talking about. Now the, co the cross was very real for them at that point in time. There was no, um, you know, completely, you know, the cross up to, that, up to the time when Jesus was crucified, the cross was something they, they, I'm sure they didn't even think about. It has nothing to do with us. But Jesus knew that Peter would take his word seriously and become a changed man. He would call thousands to repentance and baptism, even in Jerusalem itself. And you remember the experiences on Acts 2 and Acts 4 at the Pentecost. John recognized this love also. Often Peter and John worked together. Jim? 1 John 3, 16 to 18. This is how we know that what love is. Christ gave his life for us. We too then ought to give our lives for our brothers and sisters. Rich people who see a brother or sister in need let yet close their hearts against them, cannot claim that they love God. My children, our love should not be just words and talk. It must be true love which shows itself in action. Good News Bible. So Jesus assures us that life's greatest joy and lasting happiness come when we are fulfilling the meaning of our existence by glorifying God by the way we live and share his love and truth with the world. Do we really believe that? If we reach out to poor, destitute people and try to help them, we share God's news with them, is that really the best possible way to happiness? Jesus is offering us an eternal reward if we will live lives after his pattern. So what should the church be doing in the 21st century to follow up on all we have studied this quarter? Those who have the spiritual oversights of the church should devise ways and means by which the opportunity <coughs> may be given to every member of the church to act some part of God's work. Okay, let me interrupt for a second. We happen to belong to a very large church. Can you imagine the church organizing itself to set every single person to work? 
What, I mean, even in a small church, what would happen if we set, if, you know, the pa a new pastor shows up and says, okay, my job, and this, this is, you know, we're looking at inspired records here. This is, this is my challenge. If, if, if we're going to be a real Christian church, a really Adventist church, then every single one of us needs to find some way to serve. <laughs> Even in the old pastor that did it, right? Yes. Okay, uh, go ahead. Too often, is that where we are? Mm -hmm. Too often in the past, this has not been done. Hmm. In the past? What about now? <laughs> How about now? Uh, plans have not been clearly laid and fully carried out, whereby the talents of all might be employed in active service. There are but few who realize how much has been lost because of this. So very true. So tremendous loss. You know that elsewhere, Alan White says, not one in a hundred yes. are being saved. It, it should be. There should be a hundred times more work going on than there is now. The leaders of God's, if it was true then. Yeah. What about now? The leaders of God's cause, as wise generals, are to lay plans for advance move all along the line. Can in I their interrupt plan again? Good. Is the general the one who stands on the front line and does the shooting? <laughs> no. No. What's no. the work of the pastor and the church leaders? To arrange things and, and, and direct, the, direct the troops. Get everybody to work. In their planning the way they are to give special study to the work that, what does 117 mean? That's the next page. Page. Yeah. page. Can be done by the lady for their friends and neighbors. The work of God in this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and until their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. Okay, did you, read, did you listen to that last sentence? The work of God on this earth can never be finished until the men and women comprising our church membership rally to the work and unite their efforts with those of ministers and church officers. So, is that going to happen someday? Well, the, 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 maybe I just wanted to make it. Ellen White says, I think you, you also looked for that, and we found that quote, what we neglected to do in easy times, we'll have to do it in more difficult times. Yeah. Is COVID waking us up? I think so. The salvation of sinners requires earnest and personal labor. We are to bear to them the word of life, not to wait to them to Wait come them, to us, for to them us. to come to us. Oh, that I could speak words to men and women that would arouse the, them to different action. The moments now granted to us are few, and we are standing upon the very borders of eternal world. We have no time to lose. Every moment is golden and altogether too precious to devote it merely to self-serving. We, who will seek God earnestly from His draw strength and grace to be, to be His faithful workers in the missionary field? Anna? Following along from volume nine in Testimonies for the Church, it continues to say, in every church there is a talent which with the right kind of labor might be developed to become a great help in this work. That which is needed now for the upbuilding of our churches is the nice work of wise laborers to discern and develop talent in the church talent that can be educated for the master's use. There should be a well-organized plan for the employment of workers to go into all of our churches, large and small, to instruct the members how to labor for the upbuilding of the church and also for unbelievers. It is training, education that is needed. Those who labor in visiting the churches should give the brethren and sisters instruction in practical methods of doing missionary work. Okay, how many of you have been in churches 
where the pastor considered be his major job was to organize the members for work. Don't smile, Jim. That's, that, was, well, that was a serious question. What about you out there? Have you ever had a pastor who said, our first and most important job is to teach each member how to work? That's, that's what we're talking about here. What we can do to lead others to the gospel. Are we willing to accept the challenge of stepping out of our comfort zones and reaching out to try to tell others about Jesus? What would happen if even a single Sabbath school class managed to do that? I mean, Jesus turned the world upside down with 11. He started out with 11, right? right. Judas was gone. God is offering us the highest privilege that is imaginable, fellowship with himself and the work of finishing the gospel. Are we prepared to take Christ's yoke? Would anything else really matter if we actually did that? The New Testament church was on fire for God, and the result was that almost every one of them was witnessing. And I'm going to take just a second and ask you to, to think about something. Imagine it's the next day after Pentecost. There's 3,000 new people in Jerusalem, in and around Jerusalem, excited about what they have, what has just happened to them. What did the rest of the people in Jerusalem think? What, what? These guys are drunk, is that what do you... <laughs> well, that, they, that was the day before they, they accused them of being drunk. Yeah. But these right. people must have been right. I'm, I'm sure they all rushed to the temple. Guess what? Guess what? We know this. This Jesus, he really is the Messiah. This did, I mean, I'm sure that they were all just... Oh, you're talking, talking about the new converts. Yeah. You're talking about, the, about new, the new converts. That's yeah. right. And this was the time when they, this was a special time. And uh, there were people from all over the world. That's right. And Pentecost. so the sp it spread, spread like crazy. Yeah. I, I'm going to venture into something. Was the church organized at that time? No. Not at all. So are we going to, is this big work going to also end with a non-organized church? Yes. No question about it. Maybe that's what the folk need to know, that yeah, it's, it is going to be non-organized. We, yeah. we, we will, the Seventh-day Adventist church as an organization will not be what finishes the gospel. By the way, many people do not believe that. They, they think I'm a heretic when I say that. Mm -hmm. Well, think about people that were not among the original 11 that, that we know about. Stephen yeah. and Philip. Think of what they accomplished. If Jesus was willing to give up all that he enjoyed as king of heaven and come down and die a sacrificial death for us, how should we respond? Oh, isn't that casual? I mean, do we take the gospel seriously? We live in a world where many groups are clamoring for their rights. People are marching and fighting and destroying public property, supposedly in order to gain their rights. But what are Christians supposed to be doing? And I quote, Christians give up claims of equality and serve one another in love and humility to prevent the spirit of competition from flaring up. Amen. Ellen White says that Jesus, when, when Jesus was a child even, a teenager, she just says in so many words there, Desire of Ages, Jesus did not contend for his rights. Jesus did not contend for his rights. Desire of Ages. Through this act of self-lowering, Christians also distinguish themselves from the people of the world, and how, I might ask who seek their rights and engage in struggles to achieve equality with their peers and superiors from the Adventist University Study Bible. Jesus went from the highest possible position in the universe to the lowest possible position, dying on the cross. And he did that for us, to show, it, show us what divine love really means. At what age do you think Jesus began to recognize who he really was? Pretty early. Ellen, Ellen White says very clearly that he learned things. From, he learned 
from his mother's knee things that he himself had taught to Moses. <clears throat> Did his mom tell him, guess what, kid, you're special? I mean, how do you think that happened? His mother told the story, though, of things happening before he was born. And even to Elizabeth, her cousin. Yeah. Yes? Well, what insights do you think Jesus gained on that first Passover at the age of 12 when he went to Jerusalem? <laughs> the spirit of unselfish labor for others gives depth, stability, and Christ-like loveliness to the character and brings peace and happiness to its possessor. The aspirations are elevated. There is no room for sloth or selfishness. Those who thus exercise the Christian graces will grow and will become strong to work for God. They will have clear spiritual perceptions, a steady, growing faith and an increased power in prayer. The Spirit of God moving upon their spirit calls forth the sacred harmonies of the soul in answer to the divine touch. Those who thus devote themselves to unselfish effort for the good of others are most surely working out their own salvation. Mm -hmm. Steps to Christ, page 80. Imagine that. Are we prepared, as it has been suggested in our lessons for this quarter, to pray each morning, asking God to give us opportunities for witnessing to others? Our confession of his faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for reading Christ to the world. Uh, I'm sorry, that's somebody's. Anyway, we are to acknowledge his grace is made known through the holy men of old, but that which will be most effectual is a testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to him, marked by our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of his grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. Mm -hmm. A personal experience that works for the salvation of souls is an irresistible power. Why is that? The Holy Spirit is working alongside with us, aside of us, if we do it as God calls, and we are His servants. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of studying your word together, of realizing the challenges that have been set before us. Lord, may this message get out. May people realize, even in a small way, the challenge that you have laid before us. And may things, may the world see that we are on fire for you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.